Hi and welcome to Nordnet and this Q&A session with Konstantin Bach, the CEO of MPC Container Ships. Today we will be discussing the company's results for the fourth quarter and the strategies and decisions that have driven the company's success so far. So Mr. Bach has been MPC Container Ships since inception and under his leadership they have become one of the leading players in the container shipping market, specializing in serving, serving intra-regional trade rates. So, first of all, welcome to us, uh, Konstantin. Thanks for having me, Roger. So, I have prepared some questions. Uh, I guess you can answer everybody, uh, every one of them uh, in detail. So, let's start with, with Q4 numbers. They are out. Uh, the, the, main, the headline numbers from, from uh, Q4. And uh, can you also elaborate in, in, in the light of the the market trends and developments um, lately? Sure. Um, obviously, we, we were very happy with, uh, with the Q4 results. It was another strong quarter, um, basically leading into the, the best year in our history with a net profit of, of around 435 million US dollars. So we are very happy with the, with the financial performance. In addition, and I think that is also, um, uh, you know, underlying the transition from a growth company to a value company, we are very happy that we have been able to return a lot of capital to investors. So we have generated a dividend yield of 47%, so have paid back roughly 11.7 NOC, um, which which makes us actually the um, highest yielding company on the Oslo Stock Exchange. So we are, we are pretty proud about that. We, we think that is also underlining um, our ambition to, in this market phase, return capital to investors. So overall, the year was uh, a good one, 2022, in any event. So, uh, and, and you are quite a popular company uh, here at Nornet. I, I believe there is six, over 16,000 of, uh, of the owners, shareholders of uh, MPC uh, that are among our client base. Uh, but I, I would like... Uh, it is there any uniqueness among the players in, in, in your industry? Uh, what difference is you from, from others? Well, we have a very specific focus on intra-regional trades, and you, you mentioned that in, in your introduction, and, and that is something that, I guess, makes us unique. We have a clear focus on, on, on certain trade lanes, on certain vessel types and sizes. We believe you know, the demand and supply pattern um, and the whole trading is different in that size bracket, um, and we feel very comfortable there. Um, we also think that you know what makes us unique is a very clear and transparent capital allocation uh, strategy. I would argue we are a very transparent company, so we're easy to read. Uh, what we say is what we do, uh, so we walk the talk. I think that's also important for the investor community. Um, be we have a track record in a way, right? I mean, we have shown that you know we try to behave very rational in different market phases. So buying a lot of vessels mm -hmm. initially in 2017, 18, uh, charter them out um, on, on longer periods uh, and also taking selective sale decisions. So, so be a good steward of capital. I think that is very important in shipping. And we at the same time reflect a pretty low risk. We have an industry low leverage, uh, around 15%, uh, which is, is very, very low. So we also operate at a low risk profile. And I think that combination of having a dedicated focus on a certain segment, be very transparent and clear about what we do and walk the talk, I think that is what makes us unique. Yeah, c c could you also, the last couple of years, pandemic, one, one thing, the, 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 the war in Ukraine, can you give us some some insights in how has it been to to operate uh, your company in in, in in very uncertain times? Yes, it's it's obviously you know last year was was a very strong year for container shipping in the initial phase. The whole kind of disruption that has been caused by the um, uh, Russia uh, Ukraine um, conflict. Um, has also had an impact, as we all know, on inflation, on, on, on various factors that are generally not positive for the, the macro economy. Um, yet, um, we have kind of very long contracts, so I would say we are pretty well positioned. Uh, I would actually th say, even if in 2023 the market is a bit under pressure, that is something that uh, I don't think is a threat to us. It's rather an opportunity. So, um, in general, operating in that environment has been uh, certainly from a pure operational standpoint um, uh, a bit stressful. Um, we, we are happy that we have you know, good crews, good operations, and um, 
we have been been able to operate smoothly throughout 2022 but it obviously has been uh, a stressful uh, period from mm. an operational standpoint mm. I also want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, relationships. In, in, in so, can you talk about MPC Containerships' relationship with its customers and how the company works to provide high-quality, reliable transportation services? Who, who, are, who do you work for? Well, our customers are Merck Line, Hapag Lloyd, uh, Costco, CMA, so the big liner companies, but also regional operators um, like NCL here, here in uh, along the Norwegian coast. Um, we'll get to that, uh, I'm sure, later on about our, our decarbonization efforts there as well. Um, but we, we work hand in hand with these uh, guys. And I think the new regulation, which makes certain um, you know, emissions, etc., a bit mm -hmm. more stricter, um, brings together and requires more collaboration. And given the fact that we have a sizable fleet um, and smaller vessels, you are in constant dialogue with your with your customers. So we try to work hand in glove. Um, we are not just kind of off balance sheet uh, financing providers. We are operating partners. So mm -hmm. so we have a daily exchange with all our customers. We know their needs. We have an open dialogue, and that also enables us to create. For example, fleet deals on the chartering side to charter out five, six vessels in one package with Maersk, for example, mm -hmm. or to even carry out joint investments in the fleet. In these times, this is very important to have the fleet competitive. Um, and there we work very closely with our customers, and I think that is very important. So uh, a little bit about the strategy of yours. Uh, you have locked in qu quite some contracts on longer terms. Mm. Uh, and the spot market, the rates... Are the underlying rates is going down lately. Um, so what can you tell about the, uh, the capital allocation and investment decisions uh, when it comes to fleet, possibly fleet expansions going forward? Mm. You have sold some uh, ships lately, haven't you? Yes, we have, we have actually sold, but we have also bought. Mm. Um, and I think the, the, the phase in which we are now is, is obviously the outlook is not easy with the geopolitical mm. uncertainties, macroeconomic uh, downturn in a way. However, um, uh, we believe, you know, if you if you're clear in the steps that you take and don't, you know, w I'm not saying we have to buy another 20 ships tomorrow. Mm. We we will now balance our fleet, so we might sell a few vessels here and there, buy a few vessels. What we have always focused on is to keep a focus on all the acquisitions being accretive. What does that mean? That means they they enhance our earnings per share and they don't have an effect on negative dilutive effect on dividends per share. So mm. we will maintain a very clear path to dividends. 75% um, of net profit is what we will dividend out on a quarterly basis. We've just declared the, uh, the next dividend um, earlier this week. So we want to c continue on that path. We believe the uncertainties ahead require a few things. Be reliable vis-a-vis -vis shareholders that they know what they can expect. Operate on low leverage. I think this is key, especially in absence of, let's say, uh, or with, with less visibility on the macroeconomic economy going forward. Um, and and try to operate in that in that environment. And then, if there's attractive opportunities, act on them. And even if the market mm -hmm. might come down further this year, we have such a solid balance sheet that we can do both. We can maintain the dividend, and we can at the same time also selectively buy more ships, and that is what we will definitely do. Yeah, and how much uh, gut feeling is baked into this strategy? Well, gut feeling is, is, is always part of it. Uh, I would say that's usually the starting point, mm -hmm. and then you need to run your analysis. I would, I would argue we, we try to be very analytical mm -hmm. um, and take the decisions based on a clear set of parameters, and that is, you know, if you own a ship, it's always about managing residual value risk. Either you buy cheap, or if you buy slightly higher, you at least need to have visibility on the earnings to, to buy a ship, for example, with cash flow to de-risk the initial investment. And that's how, how we intend to operate, and this is how we have operated since 2017. And, and I think that is, if you're a ship owner, mm. a strategy that, uh, th that will prove and has proven to be a good one. Mm. Uh, the China situation, they have been locked down basically for three years. And uh, th they have changed the strategy as well. Um, do you see uh, any potential from from China going forward? H has has there been some impulses that you have noticed uh, lately? 
Well, I think in terms of container shipping, uh, China has never really been locked down uh, over the last uh, year. Initially in 2020 it has, but uh, when the ports and everything mm. stood still. But but in terms of container shipping, it still continued out of China. I think that was more relevant or is more relevant for dry bulk. Um, um, what we have seen, however, is from an operational standpoint, we had lockdown of shipyards, uh, of, of, of you know when you have to do your dry dockings, there were delays. So there was a disruption in services because... Mm certain facilities were in lockdown. And that, that was adversely affecting everyone in the industry. Um, um, on the other hand, you know, with China now really opening, and that means also society opening and, and you know, the, the, the whole living opening again, I expect there will be some impulses. Um, but uh, in container shipping also, the Western world is quite important, obviously, mm. as a big consumer. Mm. Um, so I, I'm, I'm personally not that negative. All the GDP figures recently have been improved slightly. I expect that the second half of 2023 will already see a bit better macro environment. I'm not saying we will see kind of a, sh a sharp uh, increase, but I'm I'm actually rather positive for 2023 second half and 2024. And for you, you as a dividend uh, paying company, uh, higher interest rates is it's it's more or less. I, I think it's good, uh, isn't it? But because we, but it has, has cannot go too high no absolutely but but i th i personally think you know the the inflation side has has is a two-edged sword mm -hmm. one is obviously you know it it might have a negative effect on consumption of people um on the other hand um i personally think that if you have a very good balance sheet if, if you can act mm -hmm. And that's the beauty in, in, in our case because we have the cash flows locked in. So we have high earnings visibility. Even if the market goes down, I rather see it as an opportunity in addition to maintaining a strong dividend to continue to um, build uh, on, on ex expanding or renewing the fleet. Mm. One final question. Uh, we have to uh, like to talk a little about the future. Mm. 2023, what, what do you see? What, what can you... Do you have any guidance? What what can uh, investors expect? Well, obviously, 2023, when you look at overall container shipping and you look at the liner companies, they have revised their guidance for this year quite downward compared to their earnings uh, last year. So in our case, we have uh, earlier this week provided, let's say from a financial standpoint, a guidance of 610 to 630 million US dollars in, in revenue and 420 to 450 million in, in EBITDA. Mm -hmm. So we are, I would say, in line with last year. Um, so we expect another great year because mm. last year was the best year in history. So I think what people can expect, uh, also given the fact that we have around 90% of the days that we have available covered with charters. So we, we have a very low sensitivity to the market environment in this year. Uh, people can expect a continuation of our strong dividend. Um, they can expect um, potentially a bit of fleet renewal down the road. They can expect that we will continue to deleverage the company. Um, and all of that in combination, I think, makes uh, to, makes me excited about 2023, mm. um, regardless of, let's say, the overall market environment. I think, as I said, if the market is good, chart rates are good, then we will deliver even better. If the market comes down, we can make use of opportunities. And that's also something I'm excited about. Yeah. Very good. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bach, uh, for taking the time to share your insights with us. Uh, yeah, and we look forward to following your company and your, uh, your your progress in the months and years to come. So I think we will conclude that. Thank you, Roger. Thanks for having me and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah. Okay. Take Good care. Goodbye.